Hello everyone, this is Defense Politics Asia and this is the summary for the day of 752 for the 16th of March. Uh, we're going to start off with the Frontline Changes uh, report and uh, we're going to start off with uh, the Belgorod Front. Uh, at the Belgorod Front, there is geolocation location of Ukrainian forces finally uh, on the other side of the border. They are inside Russia. However, there is multiple geolocations locations uh, of them getting hit by FPV drone. They are moving inside the buildings russian tank attacking uh just off the same location and then the ukrainian forces running away uh, back to uh ukraine so uh so it, it, it is not a capture uh this more like uh, no presence so there will be an overlapping border uh, from now on so this that this the front line changes at kozinka in the belgorod front and uh, we move on to the uh, at the FK front, there is multiple frontline changes over at the FK front. Uh, over here, 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 and here. So, uh, over at Novo Kalinove, there is a uh, geolocation of Ukrainian forces uh, attacking south of Novo uh, Novo Kalinove. They're attacking down, and uh, however, this is not a capture. Uh, this is just Ukrainian presence because we have no idea what is the conclusion of this attack. So. Uh, but definitely we will extend the Ukrainian uh, front line down south to this position. And uh, just nearby, uh, over at this location over here, uh, this is, I will consider this more like Novo Kalinove. Uh, Russian used the thermobaric missiles or rockets at the Ukrainian positions uh, over here. So this uh, actually invalidates uh, the, U the Russian claims that the Russians are in this position, so this is actually uh, more more like corroborating the Ukrainian uh, position. Uh, the Ukrainian mapping is actually more correct than the Russian ones. So again, we will actually backtrack the Russian mapping around uh, this area here. And uh, over at Badaichi, uh, the Russian forces have captured more grounds in Badaichi. Finally, it seems like the Ukrainian counterattack over at Lievka has uh, run its course. The Russians are back on the initiative over at Badaichi, securing the entire, the most of the eastern part of Badaichi and the southern part of Badaichi. So, uh, this is uh, based on Ukrainian mapping. So, uh, so this is not Russian propaganda. This is Ukrainian uh, anti propaganda. So, the Ukrainian forces continue to hold positions at Badaichi, particularly, you know, have uh, reserve positions in the rear as per seen in uh, video footages. So, we will continue to monitor uh, how this progress. And uh, further south from Badaichi, uh, we have frontline change over at. Uh, Olivka, just some slight change with the Russian forces as expanding their control, at least based on the Ukrainian mapping. Uh, for the Russian mapping, Russians claim the entire of uh, Olivka. Is this Olivka? Uh, oh, sorry, oh, yeah, correct, Olivka. So it's just a reduction of the Ukrainian claims over at the uh, Olivka region. But I think the, the Ukrainian claims are probably more accurate. And uh, over down south at Tonenke, the Russian forces have expanded their control. As per mentioned yesterday, uh, they attacked in the southwest and I, and I mentioned about the possibility of the Russians attacking in the north and they indeed have attacked in the north, extending control, making it more difficult for the Ukrainians to redraw from Tonenke as well as this uh, building region here out of uh, harm's way. So uh, the front line change is over in the northern part of the Tonenke and uh, looks like uh, if the Ukrainians are unable to uh, fought the Russian back, and then I think the Russians won't be too long to capturing the rest of the northern part of Tonenke. So that's all for the frontline changes reports. Uh, over at the strategy and tactical reporting front, uh, over at the Kherson front, uh, there is still fighting along the Dnipro River uh, beachhead or bridgehead of the Ukrainian side. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, where exactly the fighting is referring to as usual. So that's all from the Kherson front. Uh, over in the Zaporizhia front, at the Zaporizhia front, the right fighting mainly is over in this uh, Orykiv sector. At the Orykiv salient, the uh, Russian forces have launched an um, attack at Robotine in the northwest of Verbove as well as in the in the region of Novoporovska. Uh, there is dual location of Ru Russian airstrike uh, in this uh, northwestern part of Verbovi uh, frontline regions. So uh, the Russians are still trying to push, but uh, the progress here is super slow. So no, don't expect much things uh, around here. There's, I don't think there will be any massive breakthrough anytime soon. Uh, that's all from the Zaporizhia front. We move into the Donetsk front. 
So at uh, at the Donetsk front, this is the Donetsk front and uh, the Belika Novosilka sector, Boleza, Boleda sector and Marinka sector. So the Russian forces are attacking at Vrifnopil, uh, over at Uruzhaini. Uh, the Ukrainians counterattack at Volodymyrivka. Russians are attacking at Novomihailivka, attacking towards Konstantinivka. Uh, they are attacking also at Georgivka as well as Krasnohorivka. So this is the just strategic uh, situation over at these front lines. Um, the... I, I think the Russians are making some uh, pressure. They're putting a lot more pressure around Velika Novosilka sector, trying to draw uh, Ukrainian forces away from the Marinka sector. Um, although I don't think the Ukrainians will fall for this. Uh, that's why they are also doing their own uh, diversionary over at Volodymyrivka, trying to draw the Russians uh, to Volodymyrivka instead of focusing on, on this uh, attack over in this uh uh, flanks region no but the it's going to be um rather pointless uh, i think the everybody knows the main push is over in this uh marinka sector and over the marinka sector uh particularly at novo mihailivka the fighting currently is in the southern part as well as in the western part of novo mihailivka the russians are attacking in two different directions so uh, with the main push over here and uh, another pressure point uh, over in the western part of Novo Mihailivka. So this is the this is based on the information coming from Raiba, the pro-Russian source. We will continue to see how this progress. Both defense ministries mentioned about the fighting at Novo Mihailivka. So definitely the fighting here is quite legitimate. We will continue to monitor and see how this progress. Uh, the fighting uh, towards the Konstantinivka you know, can take it with a pinch of salt because of the way how it was written. I have to put it as fighting uh, because Konstantinivka was actually mentioned. Uh, uh, but the Russians simply said that they inflicted losses on the Ukrainian forces near the Konstantinivka. So we will continue to monitor. It may or may not be a push in this direction or probably down south from Pobeda, but we will continue to wait and see how this uh, develops. Um, there's no more news regarding uh, Krasnohorivka as well as Georgivka. We will continue to wait for more information regarding these front lines. So that's all for the Donetsk front. Over at the ADFK front, uh, at the ADFK front, uh, Ukrainians are still trying to counter attack. Uh, at the Ukrainian attack is reported at Semenivka, Tonenke, as well as Nove Kalinove. However, the Russians are also attacking at uh, Nove Kalinove, Bedaichi, Semenivka, Olivka, Tonenke, Povomaiske, and Nevelske. And you can see based on this, if you have been following the UTP-8 SIP wrap on a daily basis, you'll probably find that this looks rather different from the past few uh, SIP reps uh, because uh, the Ukrainian's uh, counter-offensive is running its course. Is They are no exhausting themselves. The Russians are back on the initiative. So we will continue to monitor. There's the, some of these frontline changes uh, particularly shows the weakening of the Ukrainian lines with the Russians taking back more uh, more positions within Bedaichi. They are pushing at content, uh, Olivka as well as pushing out in the northern part of Tonenke, increasing the, the salient or rather the en enclave that is actually uh, getting encircled uh, at Tonenke. So um, the lines might be breaking again, but don't expect too big of a change because the, the Ukrainians have reinforced this area rather tremendously. So uh, they're, they're, according to the Russian side, if you want to believe them, uh, the, the the manpower currently is still on the uh, is currently on the Ukrainian advantage. So we will continue to see how this progress. However, the this manpower advantage is going to wear out very quickly because the Russian side actually have the uh, artillery and uh, air force advantage. So it will even out. And the one with more firepower will tend to win. Uh, over at this... Uh, no the northern part of this uh, ADF car front is interesting. The Ukrainians are attacking you know, over at Nova Kalinove and the Russians are trying to grind them out with the counter-attack as well as a TOS-1A attack uh, over near along this uh, railway line uh, front line. Uh, so we will continue to monitor which with this attack also means that uh, these three, three lines uh, controlled by the Russians are unlikely to be accurate because the Ukrainians actually punch this far down south along to the railway line. I think I think the front line is actually along the railway line. So that's all for the ADF car front. We move on over at the New York. There's nothing over at New York front. We move into the Bakhmut front. And 
At the Bakhmut front, uh, there is fighting reported uh, over at Klesievka, over at Ivanivsky, as well as in the eastern part of Kachasivya. So that's about it. Uh, there is no, no, no real change around this area here. There is a lot of geolocation of uh, Russian airstrikes and uh, drone strikes uh, all, all around Chasivia. Trying to weaken the line here, it makes it seem like the Russians really want to make this push into Chasivia. But um, we shall wait and see. Uh, I still think that it's not a good idea to attack Chasivia. So that's all for the Bakhmut front. Over at the Sivas front, the fighting currently is only reported at Bilohorivka. The fighting here is reported uh, on both sides. Russian def Ukrainian Defense Ministry mentioned the Russians are attacking, whereas uh, the Russians are also reporting that Ukrainians are counter-attacking. So the Russians are attacking, the Ukrainians are counter-attacking. So, you know, yeah, that's all for the Bilohorivka and the Sivas front. At the Kremlin front, uh, there is no more fighting ring reported here. Our usual you no know, suspect at Terni and Yampolivka is not reported. So we will wait and see. Uh, the front line has become uh, rather stale over here. Over at the Svetovay front, at the Svetovay front, we have uh, interesting reports of fighting reported at Nadia. So uh, the Russians reportedly attacking on Nadia. Uh, Nadia is actually where the, there was once upon a time a breakthrough by the Russians at Raihoroka region, Sahievka region. And the farthest point that they reached was actually Nadia. So we actually see a fighting here right now. The last time that there was fighting reported in this region was in November last last year. So that was like three, four months ago. So you, it was a long time since we have seen any Russian attack at Nadia. So it was quite some time. We will continue to monitor. I believe this is just a, probe, a probing attack. I don't think this is an offensive. So that's all for the Svetovay front. Over at the Kupians front. So this is Kupian city. Uh, at the Kupians front, uh, there is fighting reported at Kotlyarivka as well as Beristovy. The Ukrainians are counter-attacking over at S uh, Sinkivka. So this is the general picture of the situation around here. I don't think there's much to talk about. Uh, very still over here. And that's all from the Kupians front. Moving into the Belgorod front. So at the Belgorod front, uh, there is fighting still happening over in the Gravoron of sector uh, with fighting reported at Kozinka, uh, wrong color, at Kozinka as well as at Popivka region and Spodero Shino uh, region. However, uh, just to qualify, uh, Popivka and uh, Spodero Shino, uh, these this are actually more like the Ukrainians attempted to attack and then they were actually stopped by Russian uh, uh, fire. So according to information from the Russian Defense Ministry, they said that uh, the attacks and attempts to, to enter by uh, enter the recon forces by the Ukrainian forces into Russian territory has been foiled. This could mean a lot of things. It could mean artillery striking, drone strikes, artillery strike, air strikes, or whatever to prevent them to attack. There might actually be no contact uh, between the two you no know, infantries, two sides. So this is uh, what happening. And uh, fighting at Kozinka is interesting because we have more footages coming out from this region here. So apparently the Ukrainians actually make full use of the forest region along this border region near the Koshkai River. Koshkla, Koshkla, Voshkla. Oh my God, how to pronounce that? Voshkla River. So the Ukrainian forces used the forest cover and try to enter into the village and it was successful. They managed to enter into the village. And uh, they were geolocated within some of the buildings. However, immediately they got into uh, artillery strikes, drone amota strikes, you no know, drone strikes, and um, and the Russian tank also entered into the front line. So and the uh, fighting have been too fierce for the Ukrainian um, forces, and they actually redrew. And even their redrawal was actually hit by mortars. So so the re even the redrawal wasn't uh, very. Uh, pleasing and the drone strike actually pinned down the Ukrainian forces so the, the situation this attack just went south very very quickly and the fact that uh, the penetration wasn't much is merely at most I would give them 500 meters at most and uh, it's actually not even that based on the geolocation from the border region is merely 200 meters so 200 meters isn't really much no I mean we can we can run 200 meters in like what one minute <laughs> or one minute plus or less so uh, the fact that they didn't really go that far 
probably is very disappointing for the pro Ukrainian side. And uh, so that's about it. So um, that's it. This uh, further up north, over at the Sumi region, and uh, that's something interesting happened after the failure of Ukrainian tech Kino, uh, Ukrainian Defense Ministry reported Russians, uh, Russian forces actually tried to enter Ukrainian for uh, Ukrainian territory. So one report is reported at Bruski, the other one is reported at Starahuta. So instead, so after the Ru Ukrainians try try to enter and infiltrate into Russian territory, now the Russians are paying back with the same thing over at Bruski and uh, what's the, this? What's this place called again? Starahuta. So these are the two attacks uh, being repelled. Re Allegedly, so if you look at the border region, Ukrainian forces attacking at the Vergoron, uh, Griveron region, Russians attacking at Bruski as well as Tarahuta. So we will continue to monitor and see if this end up becoming a come some kind of a offensive for the Russians with the with a push into the Shumi region. My understanding that the Ukrainians have actually you know developed some kind of a, a similar thing to a Sudovikin line, but we're not sure. Uh, I haven't monitored. Exactly where the this defense line is, uh, mainly because I don't think the Russians are going to penetrate through into the front, uh, into the Ukraine, and reopen the northern front just yet. I think the time is not right yet. We are still too early. So, um, so since we are here, uh, might as well just talk about some, just add some conclusions into this. But before I continue, do press the like button, subscribe if you are not subscribed. I know uh, sixty minutes in, I think this is a bit a bit difficult for. Uh, I think most people might have not continued to watch but for those that are watching and you are not subscribed do subscribe because if you are watched to this point I think you really uh, okay with you know the reporting so you know, do press the subscribe button support the channel and um, so the 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 so I want to talk about why I say that the Russians are unlikely to make a reopen the northern front just yet because uh, the, as per many of the pro-Russian side or maybe they heard me saying this and uh or maybe they might have come up with this conclusion themselves, is that the Russians' uh, strategic objective in the special military operation is not to capture ground, at least not in the beginning. Uh, I, I mean, not in the midterms. Uh, in the beginning, yes, they that's why they captured the Luhansk, Donetsk region, in the Kherson and Zaporizhia region. This is true. But the, the real objective is the militarization, and uh, there is no need to attack the north because by focusing on the uh, this eastern front particularly over in the Donetsk Luhansk region they are stretching Ukrainian uh, front line across the entire country and uh, this distance is really huge we are talking uh, we are talking about like you know talking about over a thousand kilometers of logistic and probably more because logistic don't go in a straight line so this stretches the, the Ukrainian's ability uh, to conduct war because a lot of resources will have to be spent on uh, logistic. Not just that, having more territory means more people to feed, more people, more towns and villages to monitor, to have checkpoints, have guards. Um, yeah, more administration costs, more, how to say, a pension that have to be paid. So the the Rus the Rus Russian is not. Russia is playing a, a very deep game you know, when it comes to this uh, special military operation. They want to stretch the resources of the Ukrainians to, to minimize the need for fighting and minimize the number of deaths on the Russian side, whereas, whilst at the same time uh, grinding out the Ukrainians' ability to conduct war. So th this is the reason why starting a northern front may not be meaningful and it may also be more uh, expensive in terms of uh, Russian casualty counts. There's no need for that at this moment. And it's better to just hold a defensive position. And like what happened in the Belgorod offensive, the Ukrainians basically hit a wall. And uh, the main thing is because they, they attacked very late. The Russian military today is, is totally different from the Russian military a year ago. If you, if you look at the Russian military a year ago, the Russian forces have just mobilized not too long ago. Uh, around November, December uh, in 2022, they just mobilized. So by March, February, March uh, 2023, the, the Russian forces, many of them are still without sufficient uh, refresher training. So because even you have training before, uh, going back to battle facing a totally new uh, military uh, situation the new technology uh, new doctrines uh, 
is not sufficient. No two, three months is actually not enough for this kind of training. Uh, not to mention Ukrainians are one one month or two weeks training. That's utterly not 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 enough. So the the situation for the uh for the Russian side at those at those moment is just insufficient. It is also during the mobilization part, and of course, for the Russian government to you know review if they actually have the money. So what is the effect of the sanctions? They actually know it by the end of the year in 2022. By the end of 2022, they realize that the sanctions have failed. Because the reality is that the Russians, Russian side uh, prepared for the sanctions. They, they, they spent seven, eight years preparing for it. They know a sanction will come and they know that this war is going to come. They, they, it's unavoidable. But the they have to prepare for it. And even if they are prepared for it, they are not sure how it will actually play out. So so they actually waited to the end of the year to realize, yeah, the sanctions have failed. Russia ha basically can survive the sanction regimes. And that's when they, they start to spend all the money that they profited in 2022. So they actually earned a lot of money because the oil price showed up because of the sanctions. And with all this extra money, they reinvested into the military of buying new weapons, buying new ammunition, you know, and whatnot, all this investment, as well as expanding the Russian military by an almost another 50%. So, and, and this investment takes time to play out. And it took the entire year of 2023 to play out. And so by the time where the Ukrainian uh, counteroffensive draws more or less to the, ed to the end, the Russian forces by that point around half a year to eight months in they have started to receive a lot of new equipment a lot of ammunition and in, on top of that the russians probably also made some uh, trade deals with north korea since you know the west have not wanted to play ball there is no more reasons for the russian side to apply sanctions on north korea so they started to trade with north korea solve their you no know, space program pro problems ballistic missile problems and in exchange uh, they are trading probably grains for ammo. And and this is also why we started to see the return of the Gret rockets on the Russian side. We see you know, more weaponries. The military production have ramped up over the past one year. And now they are at multiple times of what both Europe and US combined. The production value is actually you know, a lot higher. Uh, the speed of production and the volume of production on the Russian side is now two to three times, at at minimum two to three times more than the European and Americans combined. So when the Ukrainians do the Belgrade offensive right now, it just fails. They should have done the offensive at Belgorod with the aim of capturing Belgorod with the full uh, counter-offensive force of 12 brigades directly at Belgorod. That was that would be the perfect time, capturing a major city, especially it's a capital city of an oblast, would, would send short wave across the entire of Russia, and that would also allow the Ukrainians to have some kind of a bargaining chip when they come to peace negotiation. For example, they can you know trade Belgorod for some grounds, some land, something, or they then if not, then the Ukrainians can continue to wage war, focus all their offensive actions within the Russian territory. There is no need to fight within the Ukrainian side. They just need to hold the line and focus on the Russian territory because if you fight in Ukrainian land, you're destroying Ukrainian property. You're destroying Ukrainian land. You fight in Russian territory, you destroy Russian land. So that makes more sense. However, of course, Ukraine is... Uh, it does not really have full control of their own destiny. Uh, so it is what it is. And uh, another part uh, is the, the there's a lot of talk about the possibility of uh, NATO troops, particularly French, French troops, Bal Baltic troops, maybe Polish troops entering into Ukraine. Tentatively, I don't think that will happen. They, is, they are just exploring and poking and probing to see how Russia will react. Um... But I don't think that will happen uh, because if that will happen, as I mentioned before, uh, they will become priority targets. And yeah, and also risk starting a major war because Russia, in the wrong set of mind, of mind maybe that they you know, put it, it ate something wrong and then he have a bad stomach ache and then, then he have, he's in a bad mood and he declares war on France. 
Uh, we do not know, no. Then uh, that will be disastrous. Mm -hmm. And because in, in a state of war, doesn't mean that they have to start attacking each other. They will just be starting to attack each other's commercial you know, interests. It could be, you know, Russia started to started to send weaponry into Houthi territories, and this time around they have to, you know, fight. Uh, uh, they will start to sink French uh, French ships, or you no, know, using you no know, Russian weapons. Now who knows? You know, th th it can be all sorts of things. So you will just generate and uh, degrade into a wider regional war, or eventually become a world war. So I doubt. I don't. I I have serious doubt that you no, know, they want to test. Uh, Putin and test Russia again to test to see you know whether you know who is the chicken or you no know, to to try to you know to call out uh, Putin's potential bluff but I don't think Putin is bluffing uh, because if they Russia don't fight the war now they will fight the war later so now they have the advantage they should take advantage just like I mentioned about the Belgrade offensive the Ukrainians did not take the advantage when they have the means and to hit where it's softer. They decided to hit where it's the hardest and it just get destroyed. So it is what it is. So thank you for watching. Do press the like button, subscribe. I'll see you guys in the next update.